But then you gave my heart a home So I walked out of the darkness and into the light From fear of shame into the hope of life Mercy called my name and made a way to fly Out of the darkness and into the morning is to worship the Lord God, our, our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and so if you're intent on doing that as well, you're in the right place, because that's what we're going to be doing this morning. We'll continue that in just a moment. A couple of announcements, though. Um, first of all, if you are new to Northside Nazarene Church here this morning, we're going to have a, a Pastor Tim will be leading a class right afterwards if you want to find out more about what our specific ministries are here at Northside and what, how you can connect to Northside. Um, with your skills and talents, if you go right outside these doors and go down the hallway here in room 113, right after worship, he will be meeting with you and he'll let you know how you can connect to Northside Church. And I've got a question to ask all of you. How many of you already started some of your spring cleaning at your own homes? You've been outside raking those leaves that accumulate over the winter. You're pulling weeds already. How many of you have mowed your yard already too? Yeah. Things are growing and we need to take care of our yard here at church too. So this coming Saturday at 8 o'clock, uh, we'll start with a great breakfast out in the Connection at 8 o'clock, and then we'll be uh, spreading out over the campus here to clean up our yard here at Northside Church. Uh, here, a couple of the things we'll be doing is spreading some mulch, some new mulch around some of the garden areas, and uh, pulling weeds and washing windows. That's all everybody's favorite. So we need to take care of that. So this is coming Saturday, 8 o'clock. Meet out at the Connection first for a great uh, bite to eat, and then we'll spread out over and uh, clean this place up a little bit. We bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be together freely, to worship you freely, to, uh, to look to you, Lord, for our guidance, for the love that you so freely give. Father, you are our God and our Lord, and we worship you this morning. We love you so much, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me and we'll continue worship. Oh no. 
tries to hide He trembles at His voice
Chapter 3 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that we did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. Goodness of God, your goodness is running after 
it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Well, good morning, church. It's a privilege to be here. I'm very grateful to be here this morning and to be preaching with you, sharing with you a message that God has placed on my heart this morning. It's so good to see all of you. I want to begin by just pausing to um, say a word of prayer and uh, pray for you, pray for some things going on among our people's lives. Um, we want to lift up Nancy Smith. She had a partial knee surgery this week and um, was taken to the ER last night. I don't know if there's some kind of reaction going on with the med medicine that she was taking or what, but we want to pray for Nancy Smith. Um, we also want to pray for Jack Littlefield. He was able to have a surgery he'd been waiting on for a while and was able to have that this week, and he's at home. I'm sure he's probably watching this morning, but we want to pause and pray for him too as well. We also want to pray for all of those families that were affected by the senseless shooting in Indianapolis. And uh, we want to just lift up those individuals and those that have lost loved ones. And um, we want to just pause and pray for them. We want to pray for our students too as well. They have been on a retreat this weekend. There's about 14 of them and five uh, adults here from Northside. And they're finishing up that retreat today. And they'll be heading back later this evening. But we want to just pray that this has been a, an important milestone for their own spiritual growth. I also want to just welcome back some of you that uh, maybe have been gone, have been south. Um, it's great to have the Kramers back with us this morning, but uh, we've had some others too that uh, have made their way back, but it's so great to have you here. Welcome to all of you joining us online too as well. Would you just pause for me here, pause with me, bow your heads, and allow me to open with a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you for this day today. We thank you for this moment to focus on you, to turn our eyes to you, our hearts towards you. We thank you for these songs that we have sung this morning. 
and the powerful message that is in them about who you are, how great you are, about turning to you and finding healing from our shame, about walking in that marvelous light, about living under the goodness of God. Help us to believe that about you this morning. Help us to believe that despite what happens in our world, despite the senseless acts of violence and evil that take place, that you still are good. That you still love us. That you still care about us. That you are still watching over us. We pray for these families, Lord, that this past week have lost a loved one. Their whole lives have been upended and changed. I pray that, Lord, there are churches in and around the area that can minister to those that are suffering, that can hold out the hope that we have in you. I pray that new decisions would be made to believe in you and to follow you and to make you Lord. Would you be with those that are dealing with this tragedy. Lord, would you be with those here in our own body, the Northside Church of the Nazarene? Would you be with our sister Nancy? I don't know what's going on with her, and Lord, I just ask that uh, the doctors, the surgeons, the nurses that are trying to help her, Lord, that you would give them your wisdom as they take care of her. I pray for Jack Littlefield. I ask that you would be with him as he recovers from this surgery, that his body would make a full recovery. Lord, I know that there are others here that are dealing with some various physical issues. We just lift them up to you and pray for a healing touch upon them. Jesus, we thank you for this time to speak to you, to bring our concerns to you, to bring our burdens to you. We're just doing what you tell us in the scriptures, and we're hoping that we will find rest as we share these things, as we give these things to you. Lord, would you be with this body here this morning as we hear the word of God? Would it speak to us? Would it move us? Would it challenge us? I pray for those that are tuning in online this morning, Lord, that you would speak to them right where they are at. I know you're going to meet us. I know you're here already. You are here as we gather to worship you. You are living inside of us. You inhabit our praise. We believe you are with us this morning. Lord, would you make us aware of what your Spirit wants to say to us, of what your Spirit wants to teach us, of the truth that your Spirit wants to guide us into. And Lord, would you give us that courage and that boldness to be obedient, to do what it is you ask us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, before I dive in here into the Scripture, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles and turn there with me. Before I do that, I want to just give you a heads up of something that we are doing next Sunday that I'm really excited about and I hope will, um, I hope will help you be a benefit to you, will maybe give you some tools, but we're having a mental health Sunday, next Sunday. We're going to have Dr. Jenny Sears with us. It's going to be sharing in the morning service about why this stuff matters. And, you know, this week has been an example of why this stuff matters because there are terrible things that happen in our world. And those things affect us. They affect your kids. They affect your grandkids. Even if it's not directly here, even if it's not close to us, those things can build anxiety in a person. And so we want to talk about that as a church. We don't want to be a church that just says, you know, hide how you feel. We want to talk about it and bring it into the light of Jesus. Because sometimes that's what you need to do. You need to bring how you feel. You need to bring your emotions into the light of Jesus. And so we're going to talk about this next Sunday. 
We're going we're gonna to have a, a pause for lunch. If you would like us to order you lunch, you can or, we, we're going to order from Jimmy John's. You can sign up online to do that, or you can go grab lunch. And then we're going to be back here at 1 p.m. to continue another session with Jenny Sears and then another session after that. And so I believe it's going to be a very helpful Sunday because every one of us, we're impacted by the things that we read and by the things that we hear going on around us. And this past year has been, uh, has been a challenging year for all of us. And uh, you may think that it hasn't affected you much, but you might be surprised. Or there might be somebody God puts in your path for you to help. And so I hope that this will give you some tools to be able to minister more effectively to those around us that are dealing with some of these mental issues. So we're going to talk about this next Sunday. So I hope that you will come back, invite someone to join us, ask them to join us online. We're going to have all of those services online too as well. But we are going to talk about mental health next Sunday. So I hope you will join us. Well, if you have your Bibles... We're going to dive in. John chapter 21, we're going to look at verses 1 to 14 this morning. John chapter 21, 1 to 14. I wanted to stick with the gospel of John because we have been following the disciples and looking at what's taking place in their lives after Jesus' resurrection. And this story that you saw on the screen that we're going to talk about takes place probably somewhere between two weeks to four weeks after Jesus' resurrection. So we're getting to see what the disciples are thinking, what they're feeling, what they're doing in light of Jesus rising from the dead. As a pastor, I have been kind of surprised at some of the things that are revealed in these texts, some of the things revealed about Jesus' disciples. One of the things that surprises me is their lack of enthusiasm in encountering the resurrected Lord. You would think that they would be pumped up about that, that they would be preaching that and telling that to everyone. I've also been surprised at their lack of evangelism. They all have a personal testimony. They all have personally encountered the resurrected Lord. They've met Him. They've maybe touched Him. They've seen those nail marks. They, they've even ate food with Him. They have a personal testimony, yet it seems that they're not sharing that. That's kind of surprising to me because Easter, Easter is a really big deal for us as a church. It's a really big deal for Christians. We say that everything that we do and why we do it goes back to what happened on Easter Sunday. It's that important. But yet, Easter is not the end of our story. I think Jesus' disciples are wrestling a little bit with this. I think Jesus' disciples are asking the question, well, what does this mean? Jesus, that's wonderful. That's great for you. We are so happy that you have come back from the dead. But what does this mean for me? What am I supposed to do? And as a result of not knowing, they get lost in the hustle and in the bustle and in the busyness of life because they don't see how Jesus' resurrection changes anything. Maybe some of you have asked that same question. Maybe some of you have been honest with God and say, J what's the point? What's the point of you rising from the dead on Easter? You see, in the church, Easter is our high holy day. But then there's this weird waiting time, which is where the disciples are in, and it's about seven weeks. It's about two months long. And then comes this day called Pentecost, which is going to be the next milestone for the disciples because they're going to be back in Jerusalem. That's when God's going to pour out His Spirit on the disciples, men and women. But we are in this weird waiting time. The disciples are in this weird waiting time between Easter and between Pentecost. Pentecost. 
And I can't help but think if some of them are thinking, Jesus, what does your rising from the dead have to do with me getting up from my bed on Monday morning to go to school or to go to work? How does that affect that? How does that change that? See, I think the disciples, I think that they thought that Easter, when they encountered the resurrected Lord, I think they thought that that was just another ending to the story. See, originally they thought the story ended on Good Friday when Jesus was killed on the cross. When his lifeless body was taken down from the cross and put into a tomb, the tomb was sealed. They thought that's the end of his story. And since we are his followers, it's also the end of our story too. But then surprise, on Sunday, Jesus was back from the dead. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But I think the disciples think, hey, this is wonderful for you, Jesus. This is not quite the ending that we expected. We're excited about this, but yet I think they still think that this is an ending to the story. Just a really good ending that Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah, slap it high. This is wonderful. Now what do we do? You guys want to hide in an upper room, lock the doors? What do we do? Well, Peter, he comes up with the great idea in verse 3. In verse 3, he asked the other disciples that have joined him back in the, the area around the Sea of Galilee. He says, hey, I'm going out to fish. I'm going out to fish, Peter says. You see, the disciples, it's not like they were bored. They said, hey, you want to have a contest to see who catches the biggest bass? They fished for a living. This was their occupation. This was their work. This was how they earned income. This is how they supported their family. This is how they made a living for themselves. They fished. It's what some of them know and are very familiar with. So Peter says, I'm going out to fish. You know, what's interesting to me about this is that when Jesus calls Peter his brother Andrew, James and John, they were all fishermen. When he calls them to come and to follow him, you know what he says to those disciples? He says, you are no longer going to fish for fish. You are going to fish for people. It's right there in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 16. Jesus calls those disciples, says, No longer are you going to fish for fish. You are going to fish for people. So what's going on? Why are they back out fishing for fish? Did they forget about what Jesus said to them? Or do they maybe just not know what to do in Jesus' absence? Hey, he's gone. Every once in a while, he appears in the room and scares us to death. But we don't know what to do. And so they go back to doing what they know what to do, what they grew up doing, what was familiar to them, fishing for fish. I think there's a tendency in every single one of us in this room, every single one that's tuning in online, to get lost in the busyness of the world, to get caught up in life, and to think that reality or the real life starts, starts on Monday morning and goes till Saturday. And then on Sunday, we just take this weird pause and I show up at this building. I listen to songs. I sometimes sing songs. I listen to a, a loudmouth preacher. But that's weird. It just doesn't affect the rest of my life. Sometimes we think the real world is what takes place Monday to Saturday. But, you know, as Christians, we are called to be observant of what God wants to do in the real world Monday through Saturday. We are called to look and see how we can bring God's kingdom into the places that we work, into the places that we live, our homes, our families, our marriages. We are called to bring the kingdom of God into how we live, how we neighbor with people. We're called to bring the kingdom of God into the things that we enjoy doing, our recreational habits. There's a reason Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's because... 
If we aren't intentional about that, other stuff creeps in and takes that number one spot. If we aren't intentional about setting out to bring God into all of these other areas of our lives, to bring God into our Tuesday morning, to bring God into our Thursday afternoon, to bring God into our Friday evening, if we aren't intentional to do that, it's just not naturally going to happen. Other things are going to step in and they're going to replace that. They're going to take your time. They're going to take your energy. They're going to take your focus. And maybe, maybe that's what the disciples wanted. Maybe that's what some of you want. Maybe you don't want to think about real life and the things that are going on, the things that maybe you need to turn from or the things that maybe you need to bring God into because you don't want to do that. You don't want to sacrifice something. Here's an observation, though. It's at one of the low points in the disciples' lives. And you see this all throughout their story and their life with Jesus. It's at the low point in their lives that the Savior shows up. See, here's what happened. The disciples, they went, Peter says, I'm going out to fish. The other said, we'll go with you. The Scriptures tell us in John 3, they fished all night and they caught nothing. Everybody say that with me. Nothing. 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 They fished all night. They caught nothing. It'd be like you working a week and then your boss coming to you and saying, hey, I don't have any money to pay you. Sorry. That was their income. That was their livelihood. That's what they needed to make it and they caught nothing. They're at a low point. And lo and behold, look at verse 4 with me. Did you catch what verse 4 says? Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Now, the the Scripture a little bit later in John is going to tell us that Jesus is about a 100 yards away, about a football field's length away on the shore, standing there. You have to wonder if some of those disciples are like, hey, what's this guy up here doing? What is this guy staring at us for? early in the morning, we're tired, we're cranky. You know, what? being someone who enjoys fishing, there's kind of some unspoken rules that you follow as a fisherman or a fisherwoman. You know what I'm talking about, some of you? Like, when you go out fishing, you, you don't holler at people in a boat or across the river, hey, how you doing? What's going on? When I was a young kid, I said hi to somebody, and everybody scolded me. It's like, you don't talk to people when we're fishing. Why not? It scares the fish. They're underwater. They can't hear us. Just listen to me, Tim. I'm your dad. Listen to me. Jesus shows up on the shore, it says. They don't realize it's Jesus. And in verse 5, it says he calls out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? I know somebody in that boat was thinking, I wish this guy would shut up. See, this is a beautiful picture, by the way, of God's love for us. When we're at a low point in our lives, when we're not looking for Jesus, when we don't care about Jesus, when we're not sure about Jesus, guess what Jesus is doing? He's standing on the shore and he's calling out to us. I find encouragement in this because I know that there are people, you know people, that reject Jesus, that want nothing to do with Jesus. But I want to let you know, Jesus, he's standing on that shore, and he's calling to him. He's calling to him. You see, the disciples didn't even realize it was Jesus. He's on the shore. He's calling to them. He meets them at one of their low points in life. He's done this several times. When they were cowering in the room in fear with the doors locked, poof, there's Jesus right in their midst. The next week, they're doing the exact same thing. Poof! There's Jesus right in their midst, meeting them at a low point in their lives. Here they are fishing all night. They've caught nothing. And here's Jesus on the shore hollering out of them, Hey! Hey! You guys catch any fish? Then Jesus tells them something he said before to them. He says in verse 6, Throw your nets on the right side of the boat, 
and you will find some. When they did, they were able to haul the net in, or they were, they were able to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. What's even more amazing to me in this story is a stranger showing up on the shore, hollering at these fishermen, and then telling them to do something, and then they actually do it. But yet they're blessed in this. God provides for them in this. And I love the response, verse 7. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, when you, when you write your own gospel, you get to refer to yourself however you want. John just loves using the term over and over, the disciple whom Jesus loved, as opposed to all the other ones who he doesn't love. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And then check out Peter's response. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird for us. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. That's kind of a weird thing. Why? If you're going to jump into the water, why are you putting your clothes back on? I mean, you, you should strip down some more. I mean, why didn't he strip down naked? Probably wouldn't have been a real, real good thing, but I'm thankful he didn't do that. You know, I can't help but wonder with this. There was a time where Jesus, he, Jesus walked out on the water to the disciples. And there was one disciple who had what Jesus said was small faith to step over the boat and start walking on the water towards Jesus. Do you remember that? It was Peter. I can't help but wonder if Peter's thinking, hey, last time this happened, I got to walk on the water. Now, I don't, it didn't tell us that he did that. It may have just been a big splash, and then he had to swim into shore, but I don't know what was going through Peter's mind, except for that he was excited because he realizes this is the Savior. This is Jesus. So the disciples, they all make their way to the shore. And as they get there, they discover that Jesus has a fire going. He's made breakfast. And then I love what verse 12 tells us. It says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. I'm a breakfast person. Anybody a breakfast person in here? Mike, I know. Yeah, you are. I, I'm excited. That's, that's like a God-ordained meal. I mean, G, that's what Jesus said, come and have breakfast. You see, I believe that God wants to do something in all of us. And that's, it starts, it starts with this belief that Jesus is the resurrected Son of God. We could say it starts with this point called Easter, that Jesus really did rise from the dead. But we have to remember that Easter is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. In some ways, it's the beginning. The disciples had no clue what was going to happen in seven weeks when they go back to Jerusalem and God pours out His Spirit on them and the church starts spreading like wildfire. But yet all along, Jesus was telling them and dropping hints about this. In the passage of Scripture we let, read this past week in the Northside Weekly, Luke 24, Jesus tells them, hey, do not leave the city. Wait for the gift that I have promised you. The gift is the Holy Spirit. And that you are going to be my witnesses when you are clothed in power from on high. He also tells us the same thing basically in John chapter 20. That there's a gift coming to you. There's something that I promised to you, that I talked to you and taught you about, the Holy Spirit. As I've been living with this text, the connection finally starts to kind of sink in with me and to hit. You see, the Christian life is a life of waiting. It's a life of waiting. Yeah, there are these specific points like Easter. Easter had a specific day that it started on, a specific time that it started on. When you give your life to the Lord, there's a specific time and date that that happens and that takes place. Some of you can remember that. How many of you can remember when you were saved? When you first gave your heart to the Lord? What's the date? What was the date of that, Dan? Oh, okay. 
Okay, you remember how old were you? Okay, seven. Anyone else? Can you remember that day you gave your heart to the Lord? Anybody else remember that? Remember the date? Yeah, okay. But that took place on a specific day and on a specific time. You may forget it, that's fine. But that took place on a specific day and time. Well, then there's Pentecost. Then there's this idea where we are surrendering ourselves to God. We're giving everything of us to Him. And we're asking Him to fill us with His Spirit. We talk about that in terms of perfect love, entire sanctification. There's a date. There's a start for that. Now, sometimes the lines get really blurry as to when that happened. But there is a specific starting point for those big events, salvation and entire sanctification. But most of our walk with Jesus is about waiting. It involves waiting. It involves this weird time between Easter and Pentecost that the disciples are in. This waiting time. We're always in a waiting time. I mean, right now, we're waiting. I'm waiting for spring to finally be here and to stay here. I want to let you know I have nothing to do with the snow that's coming Tuesday. So don't be messaging me telling me, stop praying for this stuff. Is this your fault? I appreciate the great faith you have in my prayers, but I haven't been praying for the snow that's coming. I'm ready. I'm waiting for spring. I'm waiting for those warmer temperatures. We're all waiting for things. Some of you might be waiting for that promotion at work. You've been waiting a long, long time. Some of you might be waiting for that moment to retire from work. You've been waiting a long time for that. Some of you might be waiting on your spouse to follow Jesus. Some of you might just be waiting on a spouse. Some of you might be waiting on your kids to make a decision to follow Jesus. Some of you might be waiting on your kids to get out of the house. Some of you might be waiting on your kids to come back to the house. There's something every single one of us in this room is waiting for. But you know what? As a church, we are not comfortable waiting. We kind of, uh, we kind of, it's, we kind of claim this, you know, name it and claim it. You know, hey, you got a problem in your life, go down to the altar, pray about it, give it to God, He'll answer your prayer, you're, it's done. You're done. You're, you're good to go. We're not comfortable with the idea that, well, what if I go down to the altar and I pray about it, and then tomorrow morning, I'm still dealing with it. More than likely, that's probably what's going to happen. We're not comfortable with that, though. And sometimes, sometimes we even try to say, well... If you just had a little bit more faith. See, I want us as a church to get comfortable in the waiting. I want us to get comfortable with those around us that we want to see grow spiritually. I want us to get comfortable with the fact that some of them might be waiting. I want us to get comfortable with ourselves when we're in that waiting time. I know we're not comfortable with it because I hate waiting. I'll just be honest, I hate waiting. We want to rush people from point A, Easter, to point C, Pentecost, and skip over this point B called waiting time. But here's the thing, Jesus didn't. Jesus could have stood on that shore and said, hey guys, what are you doing? You're not listening to me. Remember I told you you're going to fish for people, not fish? You idiots. Get, get over here. I'm going to fill you with the Spirit so you can get this right. But yet Jesus says, hey, hey, try casting that net on the other side. Hey, you're set now. You're set for all week, maybe the next week with money. Now, come ashore and join me for breakfast. That, 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 what Jesus says there, come and have breakfast, is an invitation to wait on God and to wait with God. It's also a mark of someone who's very confident in their work. This is something that gives a testimony to who Jesus is. The fact that he knows that those disciples are going to have to wait. 
But yet he's not pressing them. He's not saying, well, you guys, just get this right. Just get the Pentecost. Make it happen. Come on, make it happen. Have faith. Go to the altar. Go to the altar. Pray. Pray harder. Fast. Come on. No, he doesn't say that. He is confident that what God's going to do, what he's going to do is going to work and it's going to make an impact. It's going to make a difference on their lives. It's going to make a different, a difference in, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He is confident in that. You see, there's God's timing. There's God's timing and there's our timing. Sometimes those things don't line up. You ever been there? You ever experienced that? You're praying for something. You're waiting for something. And it just seems like God has just taken his sweet time. What is he doing? Get down here and work and do something about this. People need to get saved. What is he waiting on? You know, it's interesting to me that in Scripture, the time that God shows up, the, the timing that God uses to do big things in the lives of his followers are the times that coincide with some of the big festivals and things that God established in the Old Testament. Like, take Passover, for example. Passover had to be something that was established by God because if some guy just stood up and said, hey, got an idea. Let's get the perfect lamb, a young lamb. Let's slaughter it. And let's paint our doors with its blood. Like, if I just stood up and said that, you might think, what? What's next, starting a heavy metal band? I mean, come on. That's gross. But the fact that we look with such reverence to Passover should tell us that this had to be something that was set by God, established by God. And do you know that when it was time to slaughter the Passover lamb, it would take place on a Friday about the same exact time that Jesus died on the cross? The Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. You see, God did something big in a, with a time, in a time period that he established in the Old Testament. He's going to do the another exact same thing when it comes to Pentecost. Pentecost was another one of those festivals that God established. And during Pentecost, all of the Israelite males were required to present themselves to the temple, to show up at the temple. It was a time to celebrate the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. And it's during this time, this big festival where tons of people are going to be gathered in Jerusalem that God uses that to pour out the Spirit on the disciples. You know, when we're waiting for something, it is a part of our sanctification journey. You see these points, salvation, entire sanctification? It's not like you, you go to one and then you have to jump to the next one. It's God started a work in you. And he's going to continue that work up until this point. And then those of you that would claim you have been entirely sanctified, the journey's not over for you. It continues. Your sanctification continues. Sanctification is just God's Spirit making you holy. God's Spirit filling you with His love. That happens when we wait. God teaches us things when we are waiting on Him. I can't help but wonder what was God trying to develop? What was God trying to teach those disciples in that waiting period between Easter when he first rose from the dead and Pentecost when he pours out his spirit on his people? What was he trying to teach his disciples? I don't claim to have a good answer for that, but I do think it's a good question. What is God trying to teach those disciples? What's he trying to develop in those disciples as they wait on him? Now, some of my attempts to answer that would be maybe one, maybe he was just trying to get them to be constantly aware of his presence. They've left the city of Jerusalem. They've maybe traveled a couple hours north. And in Jerusalem was where they encountered the resurrected Lord multiple times. Well, they've left that city. They've gone back home. And here all of a sudden is Jesus on the shore telling them how to fish, making them breakfast. Maybe he just needs to develop a constant awareness that he is with them. 
You know, one of those disciples of Jesus, a man by the name of Levi or Matthew, the last words of his gospel, the last words of his gospel are spoken by Jesus, and it's Jesus telling the disciples, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Maybe as those disciples are waiting, maybe God is trying to teach them to be constantly aware of His presence. Maybe another thing He's trying to teach them is just simply to be patient. That sometimes just because you want it doesn't mean you're going to get it. I feel like I've used a swear word or something. It's kind of offensive, isn't it? I feel like that's really offensive to say that in our culture, that just because you want something doesn't mean you're going to get it. That applies to our spiritual growth. I mean, how many of us would say, hey, I want to be like Moses. Hey, I want to be like Abraham. Well, just because you want it doesn't mean you're instantly going to get it. Patience. I've had some tell me that they don't pray for patience. Well, that's okay. You're going to learn it anyways. <laughs> you're going to get it anyways. I mean, it's just a part of life. doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. You're going to have to learn patience because everybody waits. Maybe he's just trying to show those disciples to be patient. Maybe he's trying to teach them the value of prayer. And when I use prayer, I mean God speaking to us, us trying to hear God's voice, and us speaking back to God, a conversation. Maybe he's trying to develop their prayer lives. You know, as we get into the book of Acts, one of the things that we learn about the disciples is that they do come back to Jerusalem, and the Scriptures tell us that they gather for prayer. They gather to pray, and there's a whole bunch of them that are gathered to pray. Maybe in his absence, they're learning to be prayer warriors. Maybe in the waiting, they're learning to turn to God first. Maybe, maybe God is teaching them during this waiting time to abandon their agenda for God and to embrace what God actually wants to do. That's also a really tough thing because we all have an idea of what we want God to do, of how we want Him to change the person next to us, of how we want Him to work in our kids' lives, of how we want Him to work in our church. Well, what happens when God shows up and He doesn't answer those prayers or He doesn't do anything that you thought or wanted Him to do? What happens? You see, as the disciples are gathered with the resurrected Jesus and He's trying to teach them and tell them stuff, they keep going back to this, well, hey, hey, hey Jesus, hey, this is great and stuff. Hey, I want to ask you something. When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, when are you going to make us this mighty force that has God as our king that kicks out these pesky Romans that puts them to death, that makes us the greatest nation in all of the world? When are you going to do that? And Jesus just says, nah, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. What's going to happen with you is that you are going to be clothed with power from on high, the Holy Spirit, and your responsibility as you wait is to be a witness on my behalf. It's going to start here in Jerusalem, and then it's just going to spread out, and it's going to spread like wildfire. But maybe it was in that waiting time that God was teaching those disciples to let go of their agenda. Let go of what they think God needs to do to, to, to surrender it, to, to give it up. Could he be trying to develop some things in you as you are waiting? Maybe there are some of you here this morning that or tuning in online that need to make that decision to believe. You need to have that Easter moment. You need to believe that Jesus is the resurrected Son of God. But then you start a journey. You start a journey of waiting, of waiting for stuff, of waiting for things. But it, don't be afraid of waiting, church. God does wonderful, marvelous things in us as we are waiting on Him. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't turn away from you. If you're praying a prayer and it's not been answered, keep praying that prayer. As we wait, we need to learn to be faithful to Him. 
We need to learn to pray, to talk to God, to try and listen to God. If you ever want to hear God speak, open up this book we call the Bible and read it. We believe it's His Word. Read Scripture, but embrace that waiting time because God is doing something in your life. God is doing something in your mind. He's moving, He's working, and He's acting. Let's not be afraid of waiting, church. Let's embrace it as this is how God makes us holy. This is how God shapes us and makes us to look like His Son, Jesus. This is how God teaches us to love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love the people around us, the people we know, the people that we don't know. He is at work in your waiting. Would you stand with me, church? Would you allow me to share a blessing with you? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. You are all blessed in the name of Jesus. Go and have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. We look forward to seeing you back next week for our mental health seminar. Those of you that are new would like to learn more about our church, I invite you to join me in just a few minutes down in room 113 for our Next Steps class. God bless.